where we'll talk about multiple linear least squares fitting using internal references. Let's get started by opening some data. Go to File, Open, and under Eel School Data, Sample SIs, MLLS Examples, Silicon L23 Gate Contact. So this is data taken from a semiconductor device. And let's use our spectrum picker tool. So I'll hold down the control key, click and drag to get a spectrum. As we scan through the data, we see that L23 edge changes quite dramatically. And we can use that change to map out the different chemical phases of silicon. The tool we're going to use to map out those phases is the least squares fitting tool. If that's not open for you, just go to the techniques, either under analytical or data fitting, and choose least squares fitting. Before we start doing any fitting, let's take a look at the parameters that we're going to use. The parameters are always in this setup sprocket, and what we have here are the options for MLLS fitting. So these should be the default options that are also in your uh, setup unless you've already been doing MLS fitting. Under computation, there's two important cap categories here. One is to use fits, and the other is to use negative coefficients. But unfortunately, we can't do both at the same time due to the limitation of our fitting libraries. What is this all about? So no negative coefficients means that it restricts all of our fitting to positive values. So we know we can, we can never have a negative yield spectrum. So by having no negative coefficients, that forces all of our yield spectra to be positive. Now what we'll see here is that we're actually fitting backgrounds too. And the backgrounds, sometimes you want to have negative coefficients. So in this case, let's turn off that negative coefficients. And for computation, let's use the fit weights computed from the data. That means that all of the data values will be scaled by their uncertainty. And by doing that, we ensure that the high intensity signals don't dominate the weaker intensity signals simply because they have more intensity. So this scales everything by its certainty. And we also want to output the reduced chi-squared value, which helps us understand our goodness of fit. And you can leave either fit coefficient or signal range as you see fit. I usually like signal integral because that gives me a better idea of how many electrons are in my spectrum. The fit coefficient is just the raw fitting coefficient. And it depends on how big your reference spectrum is. Whereas the signal integral is scaled with respect to the data that you're analyzing. Okay, so let's go from there. So the first thing I'm going to do after getting my spectrum is create a background on my EELS data. So the background is one of the things that's very hard to deal with with multiple linear least squares fitting. And we'll see that there's a few different ways of approaching this. The first way that we're going to focus on is adding the background as one of the references. So I'm just going to make sure I've got a good background fit. You see if I make it too big, I get a poor fit. In this region, I've got a pretty good fit to my background. And I'm just going to say, add that reference. So I'm going to do the edge, which is the background subtracted edge, and the background itself. So these two models here. And I'm going to call this SI0, or silicon 0, because I know that this is elemental silicon. OK, we can see that we've got this total fit, which is the black line, and that fits very well to our data, of course, because those are the references. If we move it around in this region, we see it continues to have a very good fit. As soon as we leave this region, we see that not only does our background fit poorly, you see the extra intensity there and there, but the shape of the spectrum is poor as well. So this is an indication that we need another reference. So I'm going to turn off the 1D fit for a moment and just look at my background. 
I can move that background window around if I want to. And now I'm going to add that to my fit as well. Since the backgrounds didn't match very well, I'm going to add the background and the edge as well. And we're going to call this Silicide. And of course, if you make a mistake, you can rename that to Silicide. Okay, great. So let's turn on our 1D fit again. And we can see again, we've got a really good fit here because this happens to be where we took the reference. If I move that around a little bit, we see that the background is still getting a reasonably good fit in this region, but it's actually adding backgrounds from part A and part B here to get a summed background that fits well. And now as we scan further along, we see that again, we've got a poor fit both in the background region, so these two slopes can't don't want to add up very well to this background, and in the edge region. So again, I'm going to turn off my fit, adjust my background, add this to my data, edge and background, and we'll call this nitride. Turn the fit back on. And sure enough, we've got a nice fit. If we scan along some more, we see again we get another region where our edges don't fit so well, but our background is fitting quite well. So our background is well represented here, but we need something else for our edge structure. So we need a fourth reference. So I'm just going to turn off my fit again, check and make sure the background looks good, which it does. Maybe move it around just a little bit and add this. And this time I'm just going to add the edge. So we'll call this oxide. Okay, so now we've got our references and we can do the fit. So I'm just going to hit the button that says map and we'll hide the background images so that they don't tell us too much but i really want to make sure i output the reduced chi-squared value so this will be very helpful for us and i'm going to display this on a new workspace that's up to you as well and here's our fit and we see that we get really good fitting over most of the regions of interest it looks like this region here is actually represented pretty well as a sum of these two, with a little bit of this guy thrown in as well. But the reduced chi-squared is telling us that we missed something important in our data. And that thing that we missed appears to be another phase. So it's adding some of this in to fit that phase, but it's not doing a very good job. Let's see what that's coming from. So a great trick is you just take your chi-squared value, right click, and let's move that back to the original workspace. Now what we can see by moving our spectrum picker tool so it only hits those white areas we can see why we're getting a poor fit. So here's negative coefficients that it's adding in. So it's adding negative coefficients here and a whole bunch of all three of these positive. And it still doesn't fit very well. There's a pretty big shift here and here. And it's just not giving us a good fit. So we can use that information to create another reference. So the chi-squared is telling us where we did a poor job in our fitting. I might want to just extend that out, get a couple more pixels there. But we want to make sure we stay in that region of poor fit. Make sure our background fits well. And we'll add that to our fit. Just the edge, because the background is fitting okay. And we call that sub oxide. 
All right. Now let's see what happens. We hit our map. And we get very good fitting over all of our regions. And our reduced chi-squared is very uniform. So that tells us we have a very good fit. All right, let's explore the options a little bit. One of those options was no negative coefficients. So if we force this now to only use positive coefficients for everything, let's see what happens. We use the same setup. We say map. And what we see is we still get qualitatively a very similar fit. Reduced chi-square, on the other hand, isn't as uniform. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is because we're not weighting our data. Statistically, this is not a chi-squared map. This is more like an R map, um, where the high intensity of this region is skewing our data. So it's not really giving us a good picture. So we kind of have to ignore the fact that that's brighter, even though we have a very good fit. And the other thing is because of the non-negativity, we're not allowed to have negative backgrounds. So when we're summing together those three power laws, it doesn't fit quite as well. But qualitatively, it works very well. And this is uh, using enforcing non-negativity is often a very good choice um, when you're dealing with the EELS data. To help visualize the data, we can use the color mix tool. We'll open our color mix palette and we'll add our elemental maps or our chemical maps. Nitride oxide, polysilicon, silicide, suboxide, chi-squared map we won't add in. You see that these show up in the same colors that they originally were listed. So we get a nice rendering of this. We can recolorize our maps. We could consider changing the colors we didn't like the way that the different colors looked. Okay, let's explore a couple other options. So I'm going to go back to my data and I'm just going to get rid of this chi-squared. So I'm holding down the Alt key when I click the X. Hold down the Alt key as I click that X. And now let's do another spectrum picker tool. So there's two other approaches in dealing with the background. If our sample is very uniform in thickness and we have just changes in phase, it's often simply enough to keep the background the way it is. So the background in this region is the same. It's different than this background, but it's the same as everywhere else, so on and so forth. So let's see how that works. Okay, we've got all of our references set up. The only thing I might want to do differently now is maybe change the fit range a little bit. So I'm just focusing on the fine structure of the analysis. Okay, and if we say map, and there we have our four maps. The, um, what we see is that the uh, poor fit in the suboxide regions isn't popping out quite as well as it was in the other fit. Um, that is partially because the background is fitting so well, it's sort of pulling everything along in that region. Um, there's some other regions of poor chi-square fit, but otherwise qualitatively, we've got a pretty good match. Now our third approach for background fitting is a little bit different. So I'm just going to close this guy out here, Alt X, and start with a new picker tool. Now here, we're going to fit the background, make sure it fits reasonably in this area. 
Make sure it fits reasonably in this area. So we want to be sure that we have one background that fits well in all areas. So if we had started here and placed our background fitting region, we wouldn't have had a good fit over here, as you can see. So there's got to be one region that fits everything. And this can often be the problem with this method that we're going to use for background subtraction. In this case, we've got a pretty good fit. All right, so what we're going to do is go up to where it says SI. And we're going to say extract signal spectrum image. So that's going to subtract the background from every pixel in the spectrum image. It may start off looking like nothing happened. That's just because it has a poor choice of where to put the first frame. So this is exactly the same as this guy, but with the background already subtracted. So now you can probably guess what I'm going to do. I'm going to now add my references already subtracted. So this looks a little bit more like the first set of data that we took. So we're seeing these suboxide particles. We're getting a pretty good fit everywhere. Now again, my chi-squared value is uh, set for non-negativity. So we can't truly compare region to region. But in this region where it should be very uniform, we're again seeing the suboxide particles. OK. So there's one other option I just want to show you is we go back to our data and then go over to the settings and we had non-negativity selected. So I'm going to choose use fit weights computed from data. And this should give us better statistics. However, there's one problem with this. When I hit map, it's going to tell us that it could not compute these fit weights. And that's because this data has been background subtracted. So the noise on the data is no longer linked to the intensity. So whenever you have a counting problem like collecting eels electrons, the error should scale like the square root of the intensity. Once we background subtract, that information is lost. You can still continue using equal fit weights, and that's the same way that the non-negativity works and it uses equal fit weights. So here you can see it's been able to add some negative values to compensate for the poor fitting in this region. And that is why our non-negativity was much uh, cleaner and gave us a much better data set. So in this case, allowing negative signals would be a very wrong thing to do because we know none of this data should go negative. All right, so that may have been a little quick, but I hope you've seen how least squares fitting works, and you can go through and work through the examples at your leisure. Thank you, and have a great EO school.